listen to the vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And as you may tell, I'm, I'm fighting this congestion, so forgive me for sounding a little odd today. But um, I'm very privileged to have Mr. Renaud Purifoy. And mm-hmm. anyway, he, you're a therapist and right. you specialize in anxiety and anger. Um, if I read correctly, you also worked with uh, like marriage counseling, that kind of thing. Well, my, my licensing was as a marriage family therapist, but uh, oh. I, I focused on anxiety disorders primarily. But then, you know, you get the family comes in, you get all the other stuff. So. Well, I hear you. Well, I'm going to leave the floor to you. Tell us a little bit more about you. Well, I, I, I worked for 20 years and then actually I retired because just private practice in California gets to be real crazy. <laughs> and, and I went into teaching. So I taught at a local college for quite a while. And now I'm mainly just working on uh, writing and talking and, you know, doing presentations and things of that nature. And today I've been watching my great granddaughter and uh, which is a, a lot of fun. <laughs> get to do that on mondays and tuesdays so her, her mom works at uh, uh at home the rest of the week so we just watch her the days that she's gone so that, that's the one of the nice things about the the, the zoom and the, the uh, uh dialing stuff in for your work so <laughs> i heard yeah. that <laughs> yeah. so i'm um, curious what motivates someone especially if you know you're retired and all that to uh to write a book like you know obviously it's helping people but yeah. What motivates you to do that? Well, the, 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 all my former books were written while I was still in practice uh, or, or shortly thereafter. Uh, this current one, actually, I had a publisher come and talk to me and wanted me to do something on emotions. And so I said, OK, that sounds like fun. So gave me a chance to get back in and research uh, all the stuff that's been going on in what's called neuro uh, affective, uh, affective neurobiology, which is the uh, circuits that uh, we share with animals, our emotional circuits. And mm-hmm. so I got to write about some of that stuff. and some stuff called core emotional responses and then just how to change uh, different types of triggering responses then some positive psychology which is uh, sometimes called the science of happiness you know what makes us happy so that's all kind of packed into the new book and it's just been fun to get back in and read all that stuff again and you know see what what's happened over the last 20 years so <laughs> it, it's been is because that's an area of science that really hasn't had a lot of publicity most of our uh, Neurobiology focuses on what's called cognitive uh, neurobiology, um, sight, uh, reasoning, memory, you know, that type of stuff. And so this is kind of a new branch that's come up. And you may or may not know the answer to this, but I have um, I have a, a cat, which is um, basically my emotional support animal. Right. Well, um, whenever I'm starting to feel like PTSD coming on or anxiety, Mm -hmm. um, even when I'm feeling depressed or even when my diabetes is out of whack, Mm -hmm. she always knows. And, you know, she knows to come lay on me and to calm me down and that kind of thing. Well, why, or how is it possible for an animal to know those kind of things? Is that because of what you were talking about that, we kind of share well it's, it's, it's a couple of things number one that's what we call the caring circuit kicking in mm-hmm. but also understand that you know little kids uh, they read adults uh, like a book you know they, they have that nonverbal uh, ability to, to pick up on our nonverbal uh, cues our you know facial expressions uh, our body stance tone of voice that type of things and of course as we get more and more ability to think and reason you know we start thinking we start paying more attention to the words and we still have that in us because we get vibes off of people, right? Sometimes you're talking to somebody and you just know something's off or, or this is going on, you know, or whatever. And that's just us picking up on that nonverbal communication. Uh, animals, that's their primary way of communicating. So when they look at you, they're, they're picking up all kinds of nonverbal stuff that, um, you know, you're probably not even aware of. And that's how they read what's when something's off. And of course, then one of those uh, emotional circuits that we share with animals is something called caring and uh, all mammals have that and it's counterbalanced by something called separation anxiety you see that in little kids mm-hmm. you know when, when the parent is gone they cry and they fuss and stuff 
and those two things kind of help work to bond and of course we're not we're more complex because we have this thinking ability but mm. that's still kind of underneath kind of why we miss people when they're gone and why we're happy when you get to see them and if you watch little kids you know at a park or something it's uh, really fun because when some kid falls down then you know the other kids all kind of get all concerned you know they want to look around and see what's going on that, right. that's that that's that caring circuit kicking in <laughs> so. oh the animals crack me up though um we yeah we adopted some kittens and uh one of them i guess is kind of attached to me and right. uh, i'll pet him for a while and whatnot and i mean he'll be in my lap for a, whatever an hour yeah. and i've been sitting there petting him the whole time and then i'll get up to go to the restroom or something you know as soon as I go in and I shut the door, he's sitting at the door just screaming and crying, wanting to yeah, come yeah. in or yeah, missing yeah. me or whatever. Yeah, so, that's, that's, that's that separation anxiety <laughs> thing kicking in. He's, he's, it's imprinted upon you as, as kind of a parent. So that, <laughs> right. that's something that our, our domestic animals uh, do, you know, our, our pets do. You know, one, one of the fun things that you'll see with the kittens is there's another circuit called the play circuit. Mm-hmm. And this guy, Pansip, when he was researching this stuff, he could find, like, with rats, uh, they like to be tickled. In fact, he was called the rat tickler. And uh, you can actually remove all the thinking part of their brain, and they still want to play. So it's a very deeply ingrained circuit inside of us. Oh, wow. And with mammals, it's how they learn social limits, since, you know, mammals tend to be social. And same thing with kids, you know, as they play. I mean, I watched my great granddaughter, who was two and a half, you know, she'll push the limits, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, of course, we respond, and that's how she learns where the limits are. And, and I was watching a video of this uh, old silverback gorilla and a little baby monkey poking it, you know, poke, mm -hmm. poke. And sooner, I, eventually, he just got had enough. He said, okay, enough, little one. And, uh, yeah, the baby learned some limits there. <laughs> Don't <laughs> poke the silverback, right? Uh, that's probably easier to teach the, the gorillas than it is for our grandkids. So. Yeah. <laughs> Guess I'm like you. I, my, my grandson, he's two and a half, and, uh -huh. uh, and good lord, he knows how to push those boundaries. And yeah. when we had enough, but he still will come back later on and do the same stinking things after he done got fussed at. Well, know? yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they got different personalities. You know, some of them are more strong-willed than others. So, well, one of mine was an ADD kid, and he was kind of like that. You know, I, I had one that was a very compliant child. My daughter. And you just tell her, you know, Monique, don't do that. And she would stop, right? I could say, Audric, stop it. Don't do that. And he'd just look at you and keep doing it. You know? mm -hmm. That's this one. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's an opposi oppositional gene kicking in. <laughs> you better be glad I love you so much because I would kill you about now. <laughs> yeah. That's good we quit eating our young, right? So, <laughs> But uh, to... Um... You were talking, you, you have a son that's ADHD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's an adult now. He's doing fine. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting condition, you know, because actually, historically, they would be your explorers. They'd be your people out doing stuff. Um, oftentimes, like with my son's case, which is very typical, they're very good with mechanical stuff. Mm. So, you know, so he's right now he's remodeling a house, you know, he's getting ready to flip it and down in Texas and. You know just does all kinds of stuff with his with his hands you know he like likes to work and build as, as a kid we used to spend a lot of time with legos and he'd build stuff and you know we just all kinds of imaginative stuff you know and, and they're also you see a lot of them in uh, industry in, in uh entertainment industry uh because they're just you know they, they think outside the box they're very creative individuals you know they just have a hard time sometimes getting them back in the box right so mm, they, so, it's, so it's a beneficial thing you know it's just Nowadays, our schools are built for well-behaved little girls, you know, so kids that, especially a lot of boys, you know, who have a lot of energy and stuff, it's, it's hard for them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Austin, I wanted to ask you is, uh, do you deal with the, the emotional sides of, say, kids with ADHD or autism, that kind of thing? Because I no. know it's, it's a different kind of. It, it, it is it. yeah actually with my son um when he was young they didn't even have the diagnostic category really was not there uh in fact when he was like in early grade school they said minimal brain dysfunction auditory problem they they had all kinds of things and it wasn't until they got into junior high school that i actually went to the seminar in fact of a, a 
client of mine had an ADD kid, and she kept telling me, I, th I think your, your kid's ADD from what you've been saying. So I went to the sem seminar she invited me to, and that's where, you know, this guy was doing these brain scans and talking about behavior and all this stuff. And I said, oh, you know, all the bells started ringing. I said, this is clear. I know what's going on now. And uh, uh, yeah. but that was junior, junior high school, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of stuff had already been set. So we kind of powered it through uh, high school and he decided to join the, the service. And that was actually good for him that, that uh -huh. helped to give him some discipline. So, mm. <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. It's uh, very, I, I, very, I, I... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's a very, very structured environment. So it was, it, that was good for him. So, and of course, he ended up building stuff. He was over in uh, Iraq and he was building stuff for the helicopter, you know, pads and this and that and oh, things cool. for the barracks. And so he, he found his niche over there. <laughs> it's, it's always good when you can find something that you really enjoy. And it seems like when you have conditions like that, it's easier to, to handle it when you, when you found your niche, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, uh, Back to the anxiety, um, I know there's a lot of people out there that are watching this or listening to this, uh, mm -hmm. like myself, that have suffered through anxiety. And it's not just the, you know, I've got a paper due and I've got to get this done. I mean, it's something that you experience sometimes on the daily. Uh, right. A lot of times you just don't know what sets it off. It just, it just happens and it's not one of those I can get over it in five minute kind of anxieties. Right. So how, how do we, how do you deal with people like that? Well, there's, there's, you know, there's different subcategories. The group I worked with most, the most severe type of anxiety problem is the people that have panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, everybody's had a panic attack. It's just that we don't label them as such. And, you know, I, I remember a time when I was driving and this car cut behind me and got T-bone and was rolling towards me. And, you know, I sped through the intersection, parked, and, you know, my foot was shaking on the old accelerator. I could feel the adrenaline. And, and you talk to police and firemen, and they'll say that after a, a real harrowing event, you know, they can feel that, you know, that surge of adrenaline. But they understand what's causing it, you know. Mm -hmm. They just went through this event. Uh, people with panic attacks, they, they'll have these that same reaction, but there's, you know, they seem there's nothing going on that... It, that it, it, there's no apparent reason for it so it seems to just come out of the blue mm -hmm. and of course there is a reason they just aren't aware of it you know typically i will talk to them and i'll say so what's going on well i was working full time i was going to school and then you know my uh, my mom got sick and had to care for her and i just i don't understand why this happened and it's like you know you say back the truck up i think i've got some ideas here what they experienced was a stress reaction uh, but they didn't understand that uh, everything that people has you, you can every trait that they have you can graph on what's called normal curve so like with height there's a there's tall people there's short people and then there's an average height when you think of your nervous system the reactivity of it some people have a very reactive nervous system and some people you got to slap them upside the head to, to get them to see something right so people with panic attacks typically have a very reactive nervous system. I like to compare it to like a house where the wiring is not quite up to code. Mm -hmm. So you plug too many things in and the circuit breakers trip. And essentially that's usually what kicks it off. The first one that they experience is they've just gotten all stressed out. And oftentimes uh, they like to do things well. They have a little bit of perfectionism. A lot of times they're not really paying attention to what's going on in their body. You know, they like to just, well, I'll just power through it. You know, it's, just my body, it's not that not big a deal. And so the body eventually says enough and they start having this anxiety reaction. Mm -hmm. And of course, once you have that, now you get a little freaked out about it. So you start watching for it. Um, and then when you start seeing signs of it, you're paying attention to your body. And of course, the more you pay attention to it, the more you start self -ex -escalate, escalating it by your self-talk. You start making it bigger just by telling yourself, oh my gosh, whenever that's going to happen again, this is going to be terrible. I don't know if I want to Will I be able to manage it this time? You know, those types of self-talk. And so it kind of takes on a life of its own and it becomes what we call a condition response. Um, something that's been associated with anxiety in the past will now trigger some of it in your body and they'll notice it. And of course, noticing it and getting alarmed by it then escalates it. So that can all be unwound. You know, it's, it's a learned habit pattern. It takes some time, but you can. And, and you mentioned PTSD, so 
a lot of times if you've been in a combat zone or something like that, you know, you've got a lot of triggers from that that are getting fired, you know. Now you're in a peacetime setting, but, you know, car backfires or this happens or that happens, and now that starts to trigger off some of those defense mechanisms that you had in a, a situation where there was actual danger. So that can get, you know, wound into it as well. So, well, for me, it wasn't combat. Um, yeah. It was uh, trauma as a child. Oh, okay. Um, I was molested when I was eight. Mm. And uh, it, it, the weird thing is, is how my mind blocked it out for so many years. And then all yeah. of a sudden, that one day, yeah. it, it just came rushing back. And I remembered everything, every detail of what happened. Yeah. And it, it, I know there's a lot of people out there that are suffering from the same thing. And, and that's a protective uh, device that your brain has. You know, as a child, you're not able to deal with that, those kind of overwhelming thing experiences. Mm -hmm. And so the brain just blocks it up and sets it off over there someplace. And then when you get to the point where I'm now have the cognitive ability, the reasoning ability and the experience to deal with it, your mind will feed it back up saying, okay, let's, let's, let's process this now as an adult. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times people don't know how to do that. Um, well, one, one of the tools that I used with people with experiences like that uh, is something called EMDR, which is very effective. Uh, and then a talk tool that uh, I find is useful is what's happening, what's real. And uh, let's say somebody has an experience like that and they're at a job where their boss has a voice that sounds exactly like the parent or the perpetrator, right? So every time they go in to meet the boss, they're getting set off. And it's sometimes without awareness, but if they have that awareness, oh, this is connected to what happened to me in the past, they can start using what's happening, what's real. You know, before they go in to meet the boss, they'll say, what's happening is I'm getting triggered because he sounds and looks like that person in the past. What's real is the past is over. I'm safe. I'm an adult now. I have choices. I can protect myself. Mm -hmm. This is just my boss. And at first, that just maybe takes the edge off, you know, and you just learn to kind of manage through it. But as you practice doing that and desensitizing to that person, then they will stop setting you off. And you can do the same thing with other types of situations that set you off. Uh, it takes time to desensitize, but you can. And occasionally the old wiring will kick in when you're sick, hungry, tired, or really stressed. In which case, it's a message that you've got something in your life to take care of. And that was definitely the case with people with panic attacks. Uh, sometimes they'd be doing well. They'd come back a year or so later and say, you know, I don't understand. I, I've been starting to have some panic attacks again. What's that about? So I'll say, let's go through the checklist. How is your relationship with your partner doing? How's work doing? How are the kids doing? How about your life goals? And you kind of go through that checklist. And at some point, they'll say, well, you know, this happened but it wasn't that big a deal, right? Yeah. Well, your body's telling you, your reaction is telling you it was a big deal. You need to deal with it. So in a sense, you have to keep short accounts. When things come up, you can't just sweep them under the rug and pretend like they're not there. You got to just, well, okay, it's a, re it's a real situation. How am I going to deal with it? What's, what's, what's my answer to that? And oftentimes it is a relationship issue, you know, with a primary person, you know, although it can be, you know, life goals or something you're not dealing with in your life that right. is, is important to you well i notice that sometimes when i'm going through these things that uh i will let it affect my relationship right and i don't mean to take it out on my wife well but yeah. it's just sometimes it's hard to deal with and when your sugar's off that affects your emotions as well oh, yeah, yeah 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 there's a lot of physical stuff oh yeah and, 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 you know, and, and if it's, if a person's reacting more than usual that way, again, I really encourage them to sit down and go through your checklist. Look at what's been going on in your life the last uh, maybe week mm -hmm. or so. And usually there'll be something there that at the time you said, well, it's not that big a deal. I can just ignore it. And your reaction is just saying, well, it was a big deal. So let's take a look at that. And you got some business to take care of. You know, and it doesn't have to be scary business or anything. It's just something that you haven't wanted to do with, deal with. So you got to deal with it. 
Do you think some doctors are too quick to prescribe medications in some of these cases? Because it's crazy how many people yeah. I run into that are taking the same drugs that I used to take. I got off all those meds. Right. You know, medications can play a role. Uh, I've had people where they were just hanging on by the fingertips and, you know, medication helped to, uh, uh, and of course I didn't prescribe it. I should, I usually would work with a psychiatrist uh, who would do, who was doing that, uh, help to stabilize them to the point to where they can learn some tools to where they can start to manage it themselves. So if uh, it's like with AD medication, I had one gal came in one time and I, I immediately recognized that this gal's a very ADD kid gal, right? And she was sharing with me that, you know, she couldn't read a chapter of a book. It's just really hard for her. So I suggested, well, why don't you go see this, this person who deals with adult ADD? And she went and she got on uh, some medication and she came back, uh, you know, next time she said, I can't believe it. I can actually read a whole chapter of a book now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in her case, it was kind of like putting glasses on, right? Right, you wanna, right. You want to tell a person, well, gee, I don't see why you need those glasses, you know. No, it's, it helps you correct your vision. And so it's for some people, medication can you know be a, a real godsend. The problem is oftentimes there's not been a careful diagnosis. Oftentimes it's not being monitored and it's not doing what it was intended to do. So mm -hmm. if, if there's been a good diagnosis, you've got somebody monitoring it and it's actually helping, um, then I think there's a role for it. Uh, with a lot of forms of anxiety disorders, you can gain tools to where you don't need it anymore. In fact, most of my people with panic disorder, uh, they eventually got off their medications. They might use it occasionally, like if they were going to take a flight and they only flew once every few years, then, hey, take a Xanax and, you know, calm down. Yeah. That's fine, right? You know, a temporary one-time use of it. You don't want to go through the whole desensitization of going to the airport and sitting <laughs> in airplanes and all that other type of stuff. All right. But you can literally desensitize to anything. I mean, it's, it's amazing what people get used to with, with time. And it's just a matter of, going through a process where you have some tools to calm your body down, you, you deal with the, the self-talk. For example, one of the things that's really common with anxiety-related problems is what's called what-if thinking. It's mm -hmm. also called negative anticipation. Well, what if this, what if that, you know, and people can come up with a hundred of what-ifs. And there's basically four things you do with a what-if. One is how likely is it to occur? Now, this is a problem because a lot of times people use what we call emotional reasoning. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, one of the fears that people would often have is I, I'm afraid I might pass out when I start to hyperventilate. Um, so I say, okay, so what is the likelihood that you're going to pass out? Oh, maybe 50, 60%. So then I would say, so how often have you passed out? Well, I've never passed out. <laughs> so based on reality, you know, the odds are very low, but based on their emotional feeling about it, the odds are high. So that's something you got to look at is based on actual reality, my past history, you know, what I know about, you know, th this type of thing, how likely is it? And oftentimes the what if it's very unlikely. Uh, well, one, one funny one was uh, I had a person who had trouble with escalators, right? Mm -hmm. And one of their fearful thoughts was, uh, well, what if the escalator stops and I can't get off? Oh, right. come on. <laughs> well, well I, I i understand so 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 you you with a very straight face you so you'll be there 10 years from now your skeleton on the escalator because nobody would let you off but the, of course they were like well okay so the odds probably are very low people will get off the escalator so then the second thing you do you do is what can i do to cope with it right so if this thing were to happen what would be my response in that case i said well you could just say i think i'm going to get sick and people will get out of your way right <laughs> right, uh, and so you come up with a with a, a, a um, like with passing out. Well, if you felt a little lightheaded, you could just sit down so you didn't hurt yourself. Right, and then afterwards you could just tell people, well, "I've been a little bit off lately, and you don't need to call the doctor or anything. I'm fine. Just give me a moment, and I'll get out of here." And the worst thing you'll experience is embarrassment. Right, so you deal with the odds. You deal with how would I deal with it, and then the second thing is, uh, is there anything I can do to prevent? No, oh, excuse me. I skipped the second. Second one would be how awful would it be, right? So with passing out, it would be the worst thing that ha could happen. I can think of, you know, on a scale of one to ten, it's got to be about a twelve or so. So then you go through the uh, the thing is. So would that be the same as getting your arm cut off, your kid dying, or something like that? Well, no, passing out would just be embarrassing, right? So it's not likely to happen. It's on a scale of one to ten. It's down the low end. And then how could I? Uh, what would I do if it were to happen? And then how can I prevent it? And right. that's the way people deal with what ifs, right? Is they kind of 
go through that automatically in their head. Well, it's not likely, you know, it's not going to be that bad. Most of the stuff we think of, some things are bad. Uh, and then it's just, you know, if it, you kind of count on the fact that it's, it's got a low, low percentage or odds of it happening, right? Like it's cut plane falling out the sky on top of me, you know, well, that would, that would be pretty bad, <laughs> but the, the, the likelihood is very low. So then I don't have to really deal with that one too much. Right. That's like, that's like, most, um, yes, no, never go, never mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, it's that emotional reason is what, what, what gets people is it feels likely. So it's got, it, that means it is likely. Yeah. You yeah. could go through the what ifs all day long. That's yeah. for sure. Well, what, yeah. what if I want to get out of the back of my pickup truck and I can't get the tailgate down? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Step over, you know? <laughs> And of course, if you have some particular ones, uh, like when you go out to practice, there's people who have limitations because of their anxiety, they go through practicing desensitization. And it's important to have an answer for those what ifs. And you take all that thinking and you boil it down into maybe one or two sentences. You know, the likelihood of me passing out is low. I got a plan to deal with it. Um, and it's not going to be that bad if it does that one happen. And so every time that thought comes up, they have that answer that they can give themselves. And with, with practice, that becomes pretty automatic. Well, one of the things that I did to, to help me get off the medications was getting into meditation. Right. Uh, and a lot of times I will meditate before I get into a situation that can mm -hmm. be stressful. Say right. we wanted to go to a concert. Well, crowds kind of freak me out sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I, it used to be because I worried I wasn't going to get out and, and right. that kind of thing. So I make a mental note of where the exits are. Right. That's your plan. Um, also will well, most of the time my wife is with me, so I yeah. can focus on her yeah. and that helps me to calm down. Yeah. And uh, I have to stress for everybody out there that that's watching this or listening to this. Um, what I do that, that was what, was good for me i i say you talk to your doctor before you do anything don't just take advice from me i'm just a guy on on youtube and right. rumble and all that so uh, but, it, but that, it works but, for me but what you did was important because you're doing exactly what, what i said except you, you didn't do the the assessment right i've never been a place where i couldn't get out right so the likelihood is low okay i'm going to check out where the exits are and have my exit plan in, in, in mind and you, that's important. The meditation is important. I, I used to use relaxation response a lot with uh, my clients. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I have free, uh, free MP3s of all the stuff that I used to use up on my website. But it's uh, it's just a, a standard relaxation uh, program. And then I have people put their thumb and two fingers together, and as they practice relaxation, so that becomes a trigger. Uh, in fact, we I did something like that with my wife when she was pregnant. Uh, we used uh, a, a, a trigger point on her knee and her shoulder. So every time she had a contraction, I would say, relax and touch the trigger point and her body would relax. And I remember the gynecologist said, is, is that working? I said, yeah, watch this. Next contraction. Okay, relaxed. Relax, dear. And yeah, she just relaxed completely, and which made you know that go a lot faster. But yeah, relax, relaxation response, meditation, uh, mindfulness. Uh, those are important because they help you to deal with the anxiety in your body. Along with that, the old combat breathing, you know, where you breathe in through your nose, out your mouth, you know, mm -hmm. and that, uh, you know, do that slowly. That helps to slow down, uh, relax you too. Uh, people sometimes find things like chewing gum or something like that will help them too. Uh, so there's a whole range of things you can use to, to relax your body. Externalization is important. People that do a lot of watching their body, they've got to learn to find things to focus on outside of themselves mm -hmm. because if you're totally focused outside of yourself uh, you can't be watching your body and telling yourself scary things about it <laughs> in, in fact one of the funny things about people who have panic attacks is in an emergency they're the person you want with you because i would always ask well tell me at a time when there was an emergency and, and you did well and then you fell apart afterwards and they'd all have their own stories well yeah this happened and had to get the person in the hospital and i drove and all this stuff and i got home and i had this major panic attack <laughs> well the adrenaline was running during that whole time but you were busy focusing outside of yourself and it was only when you had a time to relax that you could take a look at what's going on inside and and then get all anxious about it you know oh yeah so having things out and most people spend most of their time focused outside anyway 
So the more you can externalize, find things outside of yourself to focus on, uh, then that helps with anxiety too, because now you're not, you're not being self-focused, you're being outer focused, right? Oh yeah. Um, I, I found that when I'm helping others, mm -hmm. it just, it, I, my problems seem to disappear. Exactly. Cause you're externalized. You're totally focused outside of yourself. Which is in a way it's still helping me mm -hmm. because I'm learning, I'm learning from, uh, you know, all these, whenever you go to help someone right. and it's like, you know, you had the answers in your head the whole time but you just weren't looking for the answer, I guess. Right. And then it, it clicks. And it's like, wait, I can, I could put that and apply it to my life too. Right. So that, yeah, it's just something about helping others that helps you to, I guess, see your problems in a different way. And, yeah. and, and you can definitely better your situation. And with positive psychology, it's one of the things that makes people happy. <laughs> <Help the others. laughs> I, there's been a lot of research where they've had people go out and do something, you know, that's altruistic, that, that's, that's going to benefit somebody. And they find that if they do that on a conscious level, they are happier after a few weeks of doing that. Of course, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that personally, you know, I, I think it should be a regular part of how you behave. But, you know, in our divided right. culture, unfortunately, we don't see as much of that as I would like to. And so I understand that you um, have a book that just got, uh, I guess, audio, the audio part of it. Yeah, the, the uh, anxiety, phobias and panic, uh, taking charge and conquering fear and then anger, taming the beast. Those two just got released uh, by Nightingale Conan uh, audio versions on Audible. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was real pleased with that. I think they still have them up as a free, you know, free come on for people that want to sign up to the service. Uh, oh, wow. That, that, that'll, that'll ex I think they expire pretty soon, but I think it's still current. But yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have it out there in audio form because I know a lot of people don't like to read a book. And so to be able to listen to it while you're doing other stuff. I know my, my son was driving trucks for a while. And he did a lot of uh, audio books and things. So um, if I was stuck in a truck all day long, I'd have to have something going on. It'd drive me nuts. Yeah. Well, he did, <laughs> he, he did long haul. So he was going across the country and doing all kinds of stuff. So, wow. So how many books you said you had? Uh, I've got four active ones out there now. So uh, the anxiety, focus of panic, the anger, taming the beast. Uh, I had, I actually did a follow up to the uh, first anxiety book, uh, uh, overcoming anxiety from short term fixes to long term recovery in which I, I focus on, um, actually case, uh, case examples of three people and how they get into what is called long-term recovery or relapse prevention. And uh, one of the themes is something we've already talked about, this idea that emotions are messages. There are messages about uh, needs that are being either met or needs or wants that aren't being met or a threat that's out there. And learning just to pay attention to those messages and dealing with them as they come up is part of uh, having a healthy lifestyle. Like people that are happy, that's part of how they deal with their emotions. When things come up, they they take care of it. <laughs> um, I also find that taking care of your body and eating right and getting the yeah, proper yeah. exercise that oh yeah that helps a lot. Um, un unfortunately, you know, we've all been sick around here for the last two weeks, <laughs> and it, yeah. we haven't gotten much exercise. <laughs> well, and, and that's the whole thing. <clears throat> The sick, hungry, tired, stress, that's when old patterns will come up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and people sometimes will really beat themselves up when that happens. And instead, it's just, just recognize, you know, that you're sick, hungry, tired, you know, or there's some stress going on in your body. So be a little kinder, take a little bit longer before you react, <laughs> which yeah. is sometimes, which is sometimes hard, right? But, uh, and forgive yourself when you blow it or when old stuff comes up, you know, because that, that is going to happen at those times. And if you've got a lot of stuff down way down deep inside it will peek, poke out every now and then so uh, unfortunately some of us aren't self-aware of the, the things that we are doing and either it takes a blow up or somebody actually comes to you and says hey you know you're doing this and yeah. um how do you help people to keep that self-awareness well, a lot of it is, you know, just going over what's happened over the last week or two. I mean, that's a lot of what you do when you're doing counseling is uh, tell me about the last week, you know, how have your tools worked? Uh, because I'm very much into giving people skills like we've been talking about, mm -hmm. uh, where have they not worked, uh, you know, and then going through the checklist, what's going on in your life and how are you dealing with it, right? Well, I'm, 
I'm arguing a lot with my spouse or my kids are acting up. Okay, so that's an issue that we got to take care of, right? That's a need. So how are you dealing with it? And sometimes if you don't have enough tools in your tool belt to deal with it, having somebody help you with that, either, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a therapist, you know, uh, there are a lot of classes, there's a lot of online stuff, a lot of books, you know, like my books that have uh, things in it that a lot of times are enough for people. If it's not, then go find something more professional. I mean, sometimes it's just being in part of a group. Uh, I mean, I've got some small groups I'm involved with, and one we've been meeting for about 20 years, and we all know each other pretty well. <laughs> And, you know, we, we can offer each other advice about different things and stuff. And it's a nice uh, place to, to go and get some answers when, when you don't have them. If you have a spouse that you can talk to, that's that's a or a mate partner uh, that that can be sometimes a useful source of information. If if you can do it in a civil manner. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you can do it in a civil manner. <laughs> I'm glad you added that. <laughs> well, you know, and, and the thing is, is, with kids, and this applies to adults, when, when I've done parenting classes, one of my big things is, you know, there's teachable and unteachable moments, right? Mm -hmm. The kid breaks his toy, and so we give him the toy care lecture, right? <laughs> That's an unteachable moment. The kid's unhappy, and he's either crying or he's storming around, and you're not going to teach anything. So just maintain order. Later on, when things are quiet and uh, you're on a friendly mood, you're driving, you're, you're eating or whatever, that's when you come back and revisit it. Well, yeah, you broke your tool, your, your toy the other day. So tell me what happened. Same thing with mates, right? If one person's upset, then the other person basically just needs to be quiet. If they need space, you give them space. Uh, if they need just some somebody to talk to and you just listen to them. And then later on, when things have calmed down, that's when you do your problem solving. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I learned a long time ago when your spouse comes to you with a problem, yeah. they just want you to listen. They're not looking for your advice. They'll ask for your advice when they want it. Yep. And it's sometimes it's just, I just need an ear. Yep. Yep. Give it to them. And, and if there is a problem, you, you want to pick a time when, you know, both of you are feeling good and it's friendly to talk, talk about the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, just when you're getting ready to go to bed or something like that or something big has happened, that's that's usually not a very productive conversation. Well, I, I've gotten better about, okay, do you want advice? Because I can help you with this. Yep, Otherwise, yep. I'm just going to listen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so do you have a personal website? That if anybody wants to check out, they can. Yeah, yeah the, the easy one is it's why emotions and W H Y. So why emotions dot com. I mean, mm -hmm. my name is impossible to remember. So that why emotions dot com is easy, right? And uh, yes, yeah, so information about my books. I've got some free downloads. I've got a bunch of YouTube videos on a, on a variety of topics. So people can go there and they can click into wherever they want to click into. Oh. And uh, you have your own um, YouTube channel. It, yes. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah it's. Oh. Got some stuff on anger, anxiety, and just uh, you know, trigger points and emotions and all that, all the stuff we've been talking about. What about social media? I don't do a lot on that. I do have a Facebook page. Uh, I used to be on Twitter, but I finally disabled. I just for my own mental health, I don't do a lot of social media. <laughs> <laughs> I aim into that. In I fact, with my anxiety clients, the first thing I used to tell them is don't watch. T television news and even today i would say stay out of all of the left and right wing you know programs and stuff you know if you need to get into it and find a social you know media aggregate program someplace where they you know put all the news headlines together and you can click into stories that you want spend you know 20 30 minutes you know whenever you want to during the day get in there inform yourself and then leave it alone the rest of the day <laughs> that in itself for a lot of people helps because we got so much inflammatory stuff out there nowadays social media yeah. with young people is especially tough uh one of the things when you, you start reading the research on social media with uh, young people you find something called fear of missing out uh, they call it fmb uh no fmo fear of missing out mm -hmm. and um uh, was that fm oh yeah fear of missing out and uh they see all these pictures, curated pictures, you know, people are having wonderful times. They only see the most beautiful things in their other people's lives. 
And so there's this idea that somehow I, I'm not living the life I should be because I'm, I'm not doing all these wonderful things that everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And I think social media is great. I mean, I use Facebook to you know connect with my son in Texas and I keep tabs on him. And, you know, if you've got somebody that you have a relationship with, uh, it's, it's a great tool. But when you're just out there uh, scanning, you know, and, and uh, going through just a lot of different stuff uh, where you're just basically seeing things that are not healthy for you, that's bad. So that, that doesn't do very much for your mental health. Yeah, I'm I'm terrible at social media. I usually yeah. get on, I put my posts for my my yeah. videos and I'm pretty much done. I might like a few pictures here and there. Yeah. yeah. But um getting right. into the rabbit hole, I, yeah. I don't go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that that's really important. Uh, we're like little kids with uh, our with the internet, you know, we're like in our adolescent stage and it takes a while for society to kind of figure out how did you use a new technology, whatever it happens to be. And, and I think social media and internet, I love the internet, uh, but you got to use it wisely. Uh, it's really yeah. easy to get down that rabbit hole and just start really winding up in your brain, whatever it happens to be. So I agree. And mm -hmm. one of these people, if you're going to put your life out there for the world to see, how do you not expect people to say something back yeah so if you can't handle it then don't put it out there right uh, and, it, and like you say it's a great tool um, the only reason i ever got on it in the first place was uh facebook had first yeah. come out and we were getting people together for our first high school reunion right, right. and that was a great way of doing it i yeah. didn't really pay much attention to it after that but then you know, I get on and I interact a little bit and post a few goofy things. But, uh, you know, if, if you're using it for information or getting in contact with people or, you know, you have something you want to share. Yeah. I mean, like what we're doing right here, then, yeah. But when you get on there and you get into all the political stuff and, the you know, the, all the other junk that goes on. You, yeah. Or just all, all, all of the famous people and all the stuff they're doing, right? I honestly could care less what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one of my favorite quotes that I believe came from Churchill was, never before in the world have so many people known so much about so little. So, <laughs> yeah, No kidding. So one more time, what was the, what was the website? It's whyemotions.com. So W-H-Y, whyemotions.com. Okay. And I will put the link to that in the description of this video hmm. and um thank you sir for coming on i really appreciate it well it's it's been been a good conversation so i, I enjoyed yeah. it i will say we actually i think met in a group um was it well i forgot what you call it on facebook one of those uh -huh. group chat things and and that's how i found out about you and and uh, that another good reason why you you know the internet's good yeah, well, no, there's, there's there's a lot of positive ways you can use it. I use it all the time. It's just I don't spend a lot of time surfing around to nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Here you. <go. clears throat> I appreciate you bearing with me with um, me being sick, and uh, <laughs> I, I tried to keep up with the conversation. <laughs> no, you, you you did great. I I think you had some 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 really important things to say too. Well, I thank you. I thank all of you out there. If you are new to the channel. I appreciate you stopping by. I hope you'll subscribe and please come back. And for those of you who are regular, your support means everything. That's because of you. I get to do this. I get to meet gentlemen like Mr. Renault here. And uh, I don't know what else to say, but thank you. And so until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. Yeah. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network 